Uh, my name's Mary uh, Louise McCarthy Brandt, and I'm here today to uh, join uh, Memorial Hall at UMB and other listeners uh, to celebrate uh, Mary Matilda Winslow. Um, I would like to first start by saying that uh, I'd like to just do a um, land acknowledgement about the lands that UMB and that we are on here in Fredericton, New Brunswick. So um, we, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded history of Woolastock Maliseet. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Mulistock slash Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Wulastokwi slash Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy title, and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between the nations. So I'm then I'm now going to move to reading a letter about Mary Matilda Winslow. She was the first female black graduate from the University of New Brunswick, Fredericton campus in 1905. This letter is dated December 31st, 1954, and it is a letter which we assume is directed towards alumni. It starts with my dear classmate. While in Detroit, I had planned to write you telling of my pleasure at hearing from you, at receiving bulletins and news of the coming class reunion. I was called here a few months ago by the illness and death of my sister and the necessity of caring for a crippled brother-in-law, and I shall remain here through this winter. You asked me in one letter to tell you something of my activity since leaving UNB. Here, as briefly as I can state, are the facts. After graduation, I speedily found the limitations of the slash or quotes color line, uh, the limitations of the color line. Although my family and behind them a history of 100 years of honorable citizenship, I found it utterly impossible to find the opportunity to do the work for which I had been trained. Following a year of bitter frustrations, I accepted an offer to teach at Central College in Alabama, a newly founded school under the auspices of the Freedman Bureau of the Methodist Episcopal Church. I was made head of the normal department and taught everything from Greek to fractions. I was very much disturbed by the very poor preparation of the students in quote students and so at the suggestion of the bureau I added to my teaching duties lecture tours through the state urging people to establish and support schools. I visited many remote almost primitive areas and had many interesting and amusing experiences. It was on one of these trips I had an introduction I will cherish. Diz little fesser here from Canada, way across the waters, am the greatest educational abolitionist that have ever visited these parts. Following my marriage, despite the fact my children appeared with astounding regularity, I continued my teaching and my work in public relations. Although being a northerner, I had to be less open in that activity for fear of reprisals of the Klan over my efforts to train the Negro out of his place. I recall with pride the fact that I was a member of a committee of white and colored leaders meeting for the first time to timidly discuss ways of adjustment and cooperation. When our children reached school age, my husband and I agreed we could not raise them under the limitations of segregation, and we moved to Springfield, Mass, a city I had long admired for its cultural advantages and liberal atmosphere. 
I found Springfield very smug in its reputation for liberalism, but I also found that John Brown had left there uh, some of his evangelistic enthusiasm for complete freedom and that some of the leaders, especially those at Springfield College, knew enough of Plato's democracy to admit progress in their thinking. This teaching and lecturing before social and study clubs, before church groups with white and colored and at Springfield College, I may have had a small part in furthering the Springfield plan for greater equality and friendship. I became a widow when my youngest boy was eight, but my children had fairly good reports in school. During the years, I took a number of courses in university extension work, some of these with graduate students. My eldest child, Francis, who died when he was 23, owing to a doctor's error, was talented in art and had already had a one-man show. He was also making a mark as a concert violinist. My second son, Winslow, chose athletics, football, rowing, boxing. He was light, heavy, light heavyweight of New England for some times. He has literal ab ability, Dash, has written poetry which Robert Frost has praised, has had some of his prose work published, although he is still waiting for his masterpiece. He is a policeman in Springfield. One of his stories was used as a model in the schools last year. My daughter Margaret holds a master's degree from Howard University in history. She has taught at Las Kiki Institute, Florida, A&M College, and Howard University. She has a lieutenant. She was a lieutenant in the BACs and is teaching at present in Detroit and caring for her 10-year-old twin sons, who are already famed for their identical energy and mischief. She has a number of hours on her doctorate at Chicago University and hopes to complete her work there in another year. My youngest son Randolph is a doctor and passed the National Medical Board several years ago. He has practiced in North Carolina and Michigan. A captain in rank, he served with the Army in Korea and was cited for unusual surgical skill. Since he obtained his release from the Army, he has had an excellent paying post with the state of India, the first of his race to receive such an appointment. About three years ago, my heart joined the ever increasing membership in the Union of Hardened Arteries and demanded shorter working hours and longer rest periods. As everyone usually does, I promptly acceded to the demands and began trying to look on miss in, in, in idleness. During this last year, I've been living with my daughter in a housing project in a neighborhood now filled with newcomers, mostly from the very deep south. Nearby is a very beautiful, well-equipped church, richly endowed by the Scripps Millions newspaper syndicate, but whose members have largely moved to the suburbs. The social worker of the church asked to help, asked me to help her start the work of integrating the newcomers into the church. The church is Presbyterian in faith, and since the need last year took a firm, though to my biased mind, very belated stand on the problem of segregation in the churches, I felt that the work would be interesting and rewarding. For the membership, if offered a chance to turn from philosophical lies to the hard facts of brotherhood. For the newcomers whom ignorance and long years of non-acceptance had made poor, backward, timid, and hostile. I felt that the direct contact with the thinking 
religion rather than with the emotionalism to which they had been too long accustomed might be an important factor in their development and help them become assets in future race relations. I have found the work much better than looking at myths. In addition, I taught a class of young mothers in English and diction, dictation uh, under the auspices of the YMCA neighborhood clubs. In looking over these 50 years, I realize I have failed in the shining details I had at graduation to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bounds of human thought. I am comforted, however, with, re with remembering the hundreds of young people I have contacted during these short years. Many of these have had outstanding successes in their business and professions, and some of them have been kind enough to credit me with inspiring them to go beyond their rated possibilities. I like to think that to some of them I have given part of the two most precious gifts UNB gave to me, the ability to think and a clear knowledge of the freedom of thought. I trust I have not been too lengthy. Sincerely, Mary Winslow McAlpine, 1905, 14 River Street, Holton, Maine. So, um, I love this letter. Um, I, when I was asked to read it, I, I was very honored because the Winslows that she is part of comes from my hometown in Woodstock. I think as uh, a 2007 graduate <laughs> of UNB that uh, there are many similarities in her ability to speak out and connect with, I guess, the community in the southern US and later with the community in Massachusetts, specifically the black community, that she wanted to be a venue and a voice to help broaden the minds of her students and her fellow uh, community members and obviously her church community members that appeared to be very important to her. So um, I wanted to speak a bit about the current, the current uh, community in uh, New Brunswick. And um, so Miss Winslow, or Mrs. McAlpine, she graduated in 2005 and today is 20, you know, January um, 19th, 2021. So that is 67 years later since that letter has been written, 70 years. And I, um, I would like to pose to the community, to the listeners, uh, what has really changed? Um, how has the influence and the acceptance of black voices been um, how has the community how has the community been open to listening to those uh, voices listening to the community voices of the people of African descent in the province of New Brunswick uh, has the Black Lives Matter movement uh, how has that changed or shaped uh, the community that's listening to this uh, recording? Um, what are people doing differently? And I know for me, as my walk on this earth, um, I have been working um, dedicated. I guess it's not work. It's really something that I have no problem doing is speaking and praising uh, the um, evidence and the um, the lives of the early black community here in um, New Brunswick. Um, I recently completed a dissertation at the University of Toronto. I'm happily now can use the name doctor, but what's even more important with that dissertation is that um, I was able to tell some stories about early the early black community, how they were treated. And um, this community, which we go back to, I personally can go back to 1783. And I'm sure Miss Winslow can go back as early as that because the Winslow name was considered one of the founding loyalist families. Um, 
how have things changed since our our ancestors arrived here in the term the the, the years of well let's just start with 1784 when new brunswick became a province um we can look at 1784 we can look at 1905 when uh miss winslow graduated from unb as the first black female student and we can look at today january 2021 and see what strides have we made and and i only call reference to my work and my dissertation because I believe that there has been quite an erasure of the presence of the black community in New Brunswick and as well an erasure as to their influence and their um, resilience and their labor that helped uh, build this province. Um, so I will close with that and just leave some um, kind of questions, probing questions for everyone. and. Uh, in the in the uh, environment, I guess, of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, do black bodies matter? Uh, do black lives matter? And what has happened within this province since Miss Winslow wrote and graduated? She wrote her letter in '54. She graduated in 2000 in 1905. Um, what or how has the presence of the black community been made an integral part of the New Brunswick fabric. I would just answer that we are not there yet, but it is my wish to push and insert our voices. And, um, and I hope that you will do some more research with knowing about Miss Winslow and, um, and knowing about the presence of the early black community, the early black settlers, be they settlers servants or immigrants some came free some came enslaved um, but let's just uh, note that there was a definite black presence and and hopefully everyone will seek to know more and i will close with that thank you